What I want to talk to you about today uh, is we come to the end of a year and the end of a series. Um, we, we celebrate just the birth of Christ. How many of you know that December 25th was probably not the day Jesus was born? Okay, probably not historically, but we're not going to split hairs over that or get worried. How about we just celebrate the fact that he was born and that he came for a reason so that we can have a place in eternity. I mean, that, that's the thing that we need to embrace. That's the heart that you and I need to, to catch. But what does that mean for us individually? Maybe you're here today and you've not said yes to Jesus or made room in your heart. My prayer is simply this. I would hope that you would say uh, yes to Jesus. Um, but maybe you're here and you've been walking with him and there's just some distance. Don't let there become distance because God so wants to walk with us and relate to us. And so what I want to do today is just talk to you about our response to the Christmas story. Um, I know that Christmas in our world in America, or in the world I should say, we've really commercialized Christmas, haven't we? We've made it all about the presents and about the candy and the cookies and the toys and the lights and the songs. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But if you miss the real reason for why you're celebrating Christmas, then all you get is, is like a sugar high. You get all the fun in that, but then everything else crashes after that. So I want to make sure that we understand. You know, when I was a kid, Christmas was so much more fun. I'm not saying I don't have fun now. I'm not saying I don't enjoy it now. But as a kid, I didn't have to worry about anything, right? When you're a kid, typically you don't. Uh, the tree went up somehow miraculously. I mean, big, thick lights, tinsel. We had lots of tinsel in our house when I was a little kid growing up. And I would slide under the tree and just kind of look up the tree and just get lost in my own imagination. Uh, you know, there would be presents under the tree. There would be candies and cookie. My grandma would come for the, the week and bring her dog. And it was just family. And there was no worries. There was no problems. But that's because I was eight years old. As I grew and as there was more responsibility that I took, have you found the older you get and the more responsibility you take and the more relationships start to evolve, it feels like, I'm not saying it actually always happens, but it feels like you lose some of your joy. It's like, I want to enjoy Christmas, but I feel like there's just something that's sucking the joy right out of my life. And it's when we have to take on more responsibilities and when there's more that's required of us, we've got to make sure that we respond in a proper way. Never lose sight of what Christmas is all about. Christmas is not about being eight years old, staring into a tree and just wishing upon a star. That's fine to do, you know. But, but Christmas is also not about just hoping everything works out good or, or not taking any responsibility or not acknowledging that we had a Savior that came uh, born so that he could die for you and me. We've got to remember that. There's a whole reason for this. So this morning what I want to do is we're going to look at Luke chapter 1. And then we're going to look at, I think it's Matthew chapter 1, maybe chapter 2. I'll, I'll verify that in a moment. Um, but what I want to do is I want to look at Mary's response, and then we're going to take a peek at Joseph's response, because I believe this morning we can learn something from the two of them, even though we've been walking with the Lord for 35 years, and we, we, we got this. Don't ever become so comfortable that you stop learning, okay, church? Don't ever become so comfortable you stop learning and say, I've got this. So the question today will be, Holy Spirit, I, I say this all the time, what do you have to say to me today? Mary was thrown a curveball. She did not expect this coming, neither did Joseph or anybody else probably in their family, but yet here it is, and she's in a place where she's now pregnant with the Messiah, and we're going to read the story in just a moment, but when the question is, is not so much just what God is doing or why is he doing it. The greatest question is, is when God is moving in your life, here it is, how are you going to respond to him? How are you going to respond to him? Well, I didn't expect Jesus to ask me that question. He's asked me loads of questions I didn't expect him to. The question remains, how am I going to respond to it? I've had the Lord tell me to knock some stuff off. Have you, have you ever had that? Stop doing that. What's the most important thing? How do I respond to that? Do I stop or not? I've had, I've had it when the Holy Spirit's quickened me and said, start doing this. How do I respond to that? When it comes to Christmas and the whole story, how are we supposed to respond to a world that is lost? Mary uh, understands this prophetic. There was a prophetic word that was given. There shall come a time, you know, in the future when there will be a Messiah that will come through the virgin birth. But guess what? Mary's living it right now. She's having a now word. She heard the prophetic words. She knew of them probably. I'm, I'm kind of guessing for Mary right now. 
But now she's living it, and, and, he's, and the Lord's saying, you're it, Mary. You're the one that's going to carry the child, and you will name him Jesus. This is happening right now. And the most important thing is not just what God is saying in that moment, but how Mary is responding to it. The most important thing is how Joseph is responding to it. And even more so than that is, is how are we going to respond when the Holy Spirit speaks to us? So, ladies, let me just ask you this morning, what if you woke up tomorrow and the Lord spoke to you or he spoke to you today and said, tomorrow you will be with child? Ladies, you excited about that? Well, we got a variety of ladies. Some may say, yes, I would love that. Some may say, oh, uh uh-uh. You know, I, you know, uh, I won't say for what reasons. We'll just leave it at that. And uh, tell you what would be even freakier is, men, what if he said it to you, right? You know, how would you handle that? My wife is going to what? Or my, you know, my, Mary and Joseph, they weren't even married. Uh, they, they, they were, you know, dating. They were boyfriend, girlfriend. And this curveball that's been thrown to them, their response is what matters most. And that's why we need to take a look at it. Because sometimes we can get caught up in the everyday affairs of life and miss Emmanuel, the God who is actually with us. He, he's surrounding us. He's here today. He's ever present in your life. And if you've ever said, well, I don't see him, that, that's okay. That just means you don't see him. But it doesn't change the fact that he's not there because he is. He's always Emmanuel, God with us. So let me read to you. I'm going to start with uh, Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to start in verse 26. and read. I'm going to read you the story. And then in a moment, we're going to read it again in the book of Uh, Matthew. And it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Let me just stop there a moment. Ladies, have you ever had somebody, uh, men too, but it's typically ladies, when, when us men will come in and say, oh my gosh, you look beautiful today. Did you do something new with your hair? And is that a new sweater? That perfume smells so amazing. We start talking like that. Your radar goes on, doesn't it? And you want to know, what did you do? What did you break? What, what's wrong? Here's what's happening with Mary. Mary has an angel show up and the angel says, Mary, favored one of God, blessed among all women. And she's going, uh-huh. What's coming up? And she's, she, it says she's troubled by that and wants to know exactly what's going on. And the angel says, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, I don't know about you, but when somebody I don't know, and even the people I do, when they come to talk to me and the first thing they say is, hey, I got to tell you something, but don't be afraid, okay? What's the first thing that you usually are? <laughs> You're afraid. Because If you're telling me not to be afraid, whatever you're about to say has a quality within it that's going to probably evoke fear within me, which is why you're telling me not to be afraid. And that's what he's doing. He says, Mary, don't be afraid. And he goes on and says, you found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, and this is the important part, her response. How can this be? I don't know a man. She's going to respond to him in just a moment. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative has also conceived in her old age. And this is now her sixth month of whom was called barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, here's her response, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary's response, now let's just bring this into a reality check. Mary has an angel show up and the angel says, Mary, you will be with child and you will call him Jesus. I know you and Joseph, you know, you're dating. I know you've not been intimate with one another. I know there's no physical chemistry that's taken place, but you will conceive a child through the power of the Holy Spirit. You will call him Jesus. Now, don't be afraid. I I don't know about you, but I'd probably be a little afraid. But yet Mary's response was not to operate in fear. She didn't function by, by, by getting mad and calling everyone, girlfriend, you just know what they, you know, it didn't start calling her friends. 
didn't call even her church. What she did was she responded directly to what the Lord was speaking to her through the angel of the Lord and said, let it be to me according to your word. How could she respond like that? And more importantly, how can you and I learn to respond to situations in life that we can have that same attitude in a world that doesn't necessarily love Jesus naturally, right? In a world that really is called a sin nature, a dark place, you and I both know that there is a day coming. We don't know when it is, but there's a day coming, the Bible says, that this, this will cease, this world will end. And what matters most is if we've made room in our heart for Jesus. And whether you believe that or not right now, I, I, I've had plenty of people say, how are you sure? And I say, well, let me put it this way. Let's say that I'm wrong about Jesus and heaven and all that. And, and, and uh, let, let, let's just say I'm wrong about all this stuff in that, but yet I live for Jesus. When my time comes, I've lost, you know, no skin off my nose. But let's say I'm right, and you decide not to live for Jesus. And you've got to stand before an almighty God and hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. I don't know about you, but I want to make sure my faith has been secured in, in the Son of God. Not just how I feel or what I want, but I want to be able to be a kind of a person that can respond like Mary does and say, let it be unto me, Lord, uh, according to your word. That's got to be our response. See, there's a lot of components that are going on right now. A lot of components that are going on with Mary at this specific moment and how she chooses to respond to them are very critical. Think about the news she's just received. You will be with child. Well, how can I be with child? I haven't been with a man. Uh, his name will be Jesus. And she's thinking, what? Like the word that was prophesied? You know, and she's probably thinking to herself too, like, I don't understand. What are my parents going to think about this? They're not going to believe this. There's nobody that's going to buy this, this story. What's Joseph going to say? Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. What's Joseph going to say when he finds out I'm with child? And I say, no, 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 really, I've not been with a guy. He's going to be like, mm-hmm. How am I going to answer this? How am I going to respond to this? And she probably started feeling like, I don't know if I can do this. Now, I'm taking a lot of liberty guessing what Mary might be thinking. That's not in the Bible. I'm just kind of thinking, I don't know about you, but if, if something like that happened in our natural world, we would start using this first. Yeah, hopefully this second, but it might even be third or fourth. <laughs> we need to learn to respond in a way that we understand that even though the world may have uh, one plan or the desires, are we going to respond to God according to his word or are we going to respond to ourselves according to the world? There's so much going on for this young woman right now, and you've got to remember this, culturally, uh, you know, where she's at, and in that time, for a woman to be pregnant out of wedlock was a death sentence. If they found out that she was pregnant outside of the bonds of marriage, then by law, they had every right to take her outside of the city and stone her with big rocks until she's dead, which meant that, you know, Jesus within her would have been dead, but that's not what happened, as we know in the story, but can you, can you just imagine this, knowing that you've been found with child and, and, and you could lose your life. Your whole community could turn against you. The fear that may, may, may rise. I mean, I'm sure Mary had plans for her life. She was probably thinking, man, I was going to do so many things. I was going to attend the University of Bethlehem and, and get my degree and do all these things. And all of a sudden, things have changed. All of a sudden, things, God has intervened and shown up. And the question is, is how are you going to respond when God shows up in your life? And it may mess with your thinking. Or it may mess things up. See, it's at this point where there's the potential for so much chaos that's surrounding her in Joseph's life. It could have been so daunting, a feeling of, of uh, you know, just what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? Maybe you've been there. You've been in that place where you've been stuck or you feel lost. What am I going to do now? What's, what's my next step? Uh, life's gotten chaotic. Uh, the plans I had... Uh, they appear to be messed up. Life has changed without my permission. What am I going to do? See, the same thing that the angel presented to Mary, uh, depending on your response, you're either going to see the painful or you're going to see the promise, depending on how you respond. And when you respond like Mary did, you'll see the promises of God. They may not come exactly the way you expected them, but they will come. And so I believe there's something that we can learn here. And we're going to look at Joseph's uh, response or uh, his side of the story in just a moment. But I believe there's so many things that, that we can learn. And the first one is this. In your outlines, write this down. You and I have to become comfortable or being okay with having a messy Christmas. Okay? We have to be okay with 
having a messy Christmas. What do I mean by that? Well, Genesis chapter 1, if I were to back up to the beginning, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the world or of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Chaos. There was no order. There was no direction. And it says that the, that the Holy Spirit was there. And then when he started to speak life and bring order and, and that, that's when things changed. But everything was a mess. How many of you know that no matter how messy life can be, when Jesus shows up, everything changes? Do you know that? Everything changes if you're willing to respond to him. See, in order for God to do a new thing in us, we're going to have to allow him to navigate us through the chaos of our plans in our life. Now, I, I, I don't want to you know, be so graphic or detailed, I, but, but I think we're all fairly mature adults that understand that when a woman is pregnant and there's the birthing process that takes place, it's not always a clean experience, is it? it it's kind of messy. And uh, you know, I, I know that we, when we had our kids, I've shared with you before, we've had trouble, I don't want to say like trouble like, it just you know, we had many pregnancies and it was, Drea was the first that um, she, she, she made it, but she gave us troubles along the way, right? She was premature, she was jaundice, she was breech, and then she finally showed up, you know, and I'm like, child, you know, and, and I pick on her to this day, and then Seth, when he was born, uh, okay, he's, he's premature, he, he came early, and there was actually like a medical crisis called placenta abrupto, abruptio, and um, it, it's a serious condition where just for the sake of today's talk, uh, typically what happens is the wife dies and then the child dies shortly after. And that's what was going on with Seth. He was premature. He had that going on. We never had an easy time having kids. And I want to tell you something. For one, with Drea, I was able to be there and be a part of the process. With Seth, I was not able to be there for part of the process because it was an emergency surgery that was required. But I can guarantee you in both of those scenarios, and I don't speak as somebody that's an authority in giving birth to a child, okay? But I can, I can say this enough that in the middle of that, sometimes it gets messy, but we never focus on the mess for this simple reason. There's always a rejoicing in the life that's produced out of it. There's always a, 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 a rejoicing in the new life that comes because something is being birthed. If your life is feeling kind of messy right now, that's normal. That happens. Surround yourself with good people. Help you think things through. But know this, if you're leaning into God, though it's messy, there's always a miracle in the middle of it. There's always a promise that God gives you. Well, I want it now. Me too. But it doesn't always come when I want it. And I have to wait upon the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord do what? Re you, yeah, you renew your strength. You renew your strength. You cannot get through the birthing process without there being a little bit of a mess. It's going to be a part of life. Christianity, by the way, can be a messy deal. It's not always clean. It's not always tidy. It's not always prepackaged. You know, how to be a Christian in seven easy steps. It's simple. It's simple. But my point is simply this. It's a journey as well. It's not something that you just arrive at and say, I'm perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're always in a perfecting process. It's the journey of our, of our faith. So I got thinking about Joseph. And so I want to just jump over to, I'm going to jump over to Matthew chapter 1. And I'm going to start at verse 18, and this is the same story I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you. But we're going to hear kind of Joseph's side of it when the angel of the Lord showed up and talked to him. It says in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he was a good guy, not wanting to make her a public example, because he knew what the penalty was, he was minded to put her away secretly. In other words, you know, we, we don't know, hide her, get rid of her, dump her. We don't know exactly. But it says, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared. And he appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. So all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded, took him to his wife and did not know her in a physical way 
until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and they named him Jesus. You see, in both scenarios, what mattered most is, number one, that the Holy Spirit showed up, that God showed up and spoke to them, but just as much, if not more importantly, was how they responded to the presence of the Lord when he did show up. Jesus is going to show up and he'll speak to you at times. The question isn't, will God speak? The question is, is when he does, how will you respond? Will you respond in ways that glorify and honor God? Or will you respond in ways that glorify and honor you or me? You know, I think one of the missing ingredients in our, in our world today is the uh, principle of honor. Uh, I, you know, I actually thought, I, I really want to do some studying on that. And, and I'm sure there's stuff out there I just haven't found yet. But the reality is, is when I went looking for it, there's not much out there on the principle of honor. We've become a society and a culture that have forgotten what it means to honor. Honor God, honor others, honor yourself. We, 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 we learn about living for ourselves. We learn about how to, how to get our ways met and get our needs met. But we just lose some of those principles. My personal opinion, this is just Jim talking, as soon as we started taking prayer out of school, started taking the pledge out of school, once we started... Uh, dealing with situations for pro-life or not, we all of a sudden cut, off, right, we cut ourselves off right at the kneecaps. And we start missing that principle of honor. See, we've not responded. Now, I'm not going to get off on a tangent with that. I want to be careful about that. That's just my opinion. That's all I'm going to say. But my point is simply this. When God speaks to you as an individual, how will you respond? Because that's going to affect you as a greater whole when it's your family. How will your family respond to situations? How will your church respond to situations? How will your community respond to situations? It makes all the difference in the world. And the reality is this. It is going to be messy. But don't be afraid of the mess. Because if God's in the middle of the mess, you're all good. God's got this. He's got your back on this. So Joseph, he planned to marry Mary and have a family. But his plan was taken away. Maybe you felt that way before where I got a plan. This is my direction. This is what I'm going to do. I feel good. I feel confident. I feel pretty secure about it. And all of a sudden, it's gone. But here's the reality. The only reason it was gone is because God showed up and gave him something better. I'll, I can't say that. I was going to say I'll guarantee you, but I'm, I'm going to eat those words, okay? I can't guarantee you because I don't know Joseph. But if I can just speak as a guy, if somebody were to show up to me and say, tomorrow your wife will be with child, and everything's going to be okay. I would question that. I would doubt that. I would worry. I'd be afraid. You know, that, 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 those are the thoughts that would be going on in my head and in my heart and in my life. But yet Joseph responded in trusting in the Lord. His plan may have been taken away, but he eventually found out it's because God had a greater plan. If you're going through a situation right now where you feel like you've been ripped off, you feel like you're lacking direction, you feel like, I don't know, if I, you know what my next step is, God has a plan for you. He has such a great plan for you. And if you feel like the plan you had hasn't come to fruition, and it's because God has something better, you can take that to the bank. You can trust in that. You know, maybe you're here today and you identify with Joseph in that feeling of having your plan taken away. You had an idea, and it was going to go this way, and then it, it didn't. You thought this relationship was going to work out, but it hasn't. You hoped you'd be happier right now, but... You're not. See, whatever it is for you, I'm sure we've all been in a place where we thought everything is going to be great, and then it got messier. You ever notice that? I, I, I don't want to say that I became cynical, but there's times in life where I'd be going so high, I'd be like, I'm feeling so good right now, I might as well just start puckering up right now because I know something's coming, right? You know it's coming down the pike. And that's just a part of life. There's ups and there's downs. And the question is, is are you going to be okay with having a messy Christmas? Remember, Christmas is not December 25th. Christmas is an everyday thing. Did you know that? We celebrate the birth of Jesus every day, not just one day out of the year. We are to celebrate him every day. We may celebrate collectively or corporately uh, this Christmas thing, but every, that's an everyday thing that we are to celebrate. And so when things seem messy, God says, and he tells us to stay encouraged, even though we're in the middle of the mess, when Jesus is in it, by the way, and he calls us like he did Mary to do this, right down in that little bullet, to cooperate with God's plans, to cooperate. See, if you're going to be willing to have a messy Christmas, you're going to have to be willing to cooperate with God's plans because he's the only one that's going to get you through the mess anyway. Because how do you know or not know that maybe just maybe God wants to give you his eyes so you can see what he sees instead of just seeing what you always see. 
last week, Lisa shared, uh, Pastor Lisa, she was sharing, um, she brought up a picture of our son who got uh, glasses because he's colorblind. Uh, we didn't know that. You know, we figured it out eventually. And, 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 and Lisa told you most of the story of that. But what, what so intrigued me was, and I didn't bring a picture to show you, but we bought him at the age of 19, I think he was at the time. And <clears throat> we took him to Eagle Point Park. And you probably saw the pictures last week. The balloons, orange and red and blue and green and purple and yellow and all these colors. And we had him put the glasses on. And in the picture, Lisa, myself, and Dre are looking at the camera. Jeez. Seth's staring at the balloon. He's got in his hand a purple balloon. And he's in awe over this purple balloon. And I watched him. What really moved me was is I, I wanted to just, I wish I could have peeked in, you know, sh- shoved my head in his ear and listened in on his thoughts, you know. What is he hearing? What is he experiencing for the first time? What is it that's going through his head and his, his mind as he sees this? And it's not that he got emotional or anything, but he just, that's purple. I've never, I've never seen purple before. And it was a new experience because he had some new eyes that were on his face. He could now see something he never saw before. But here's the funny funny thing, folks. Purple's been all around his life for 19 years. He never saw it until he got the right set of eyes. You and I are surrounded by the promises of God. They're everywhere that we go, but you will not see them unless you and I are willing to cooperate with God's plans so that we can see what he sees. See, having a messy Christmas doesn't mean just be okay with, well, this, 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 this uh, Christmas is going to stink, and we have family issues, and we're just going to fight and fuss, but I'll be okay with it. That's not what I'm encouraging. What I'm encouraging is, is even though life may be messy, you don't have all the answers, you don't have everything figured out, you lean into God, and you let him, you cooperate with his plans so that you can gain his eyes, so you can start to see the purple in your life. So you can start to see the promises of God in your life. I watched him and thought, man, I wish I could just know what's going through his mind. Because for the first time in his life, he thought he knew what he was talking about until he got some new eyes. Now he's experiencing it. And I got to tell you, folks, there's a lot of times in my younger years, I thought I knew what I was talking about. But it wasn't until I got a new set of eyes and I was able to cooperate with what God was doing that I found out, even though it seems like he took my plan away from me, because he's got something much better that he wants to give me in place of that. I'd love to take him looking at Christmas lights. Did you ever do this as a kid or take your kids and you drive around at nighttime and look at all the Christmas lights and look at the lights, those are pretty, hey, they're frosty, you know. We did that with our kids, not knowing. I mean, they both loved it, but we didn't know at that time Dre was seeing something completely different than what Seth was seeing. He could see some colors, but we didn't know it at the time One was seeing one thing, one was seeing another. And it wasn't until their eye or their vision was corrected that they could see what everyone else saw. You and I, once we let the Holy Spirit correct our spiritual vision, then we'll get to see what it is that God has for us. Uh, So we've got to learn to be okay with the mess when God's in the middle of it. You remember the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas? I'd encourage you to be okay with saying, Have Yourself a Messy Little Christmas. As long as Jesus is in the middle of it. Because if he's in the middle of it, You'll see purple pretty soon. You'll see the promises of God revealed in your life. Number two, write this down. Not only be okay with having a messy Christmas, but have a Merry Christmas. M-A-R-Y. An M-A-R-Y Merry Christmas. If I want, if we want to have the joy of the Lord in every area of our life, then we must have the same heart that Mary had. Why? Because Mary was so great. Mary was so good. Well, yes and no. It's not about Mary. It's about how she responded to the angel of the Lord, how she responded to his voice. God unexpectedly changed Mary's plans, but she was willing to respond to God in a way that even though it didn't make sense, she was probably scared to death, she still brought honor to God. She still brought honor to God. Mary wasn't quite sure what was all going on. She was confused. Uh, You know, we learned from the previous reading in Luke chapter 1 that it says she was greatly troubled. It says that she was afraid, and I'm guessing she probably had a lot of questions. You would too. If an angel of the Lord showed up and said, tomorrow morning you will be, chi- you know, you'll be pregnant with a child, you say, whoa, 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 hold on, Jack. <laughs> what are you talking about? And you want more answers. You got a lot of questions. She probably had those same ones. But yet in the middle of all that, because she's, she's a 
human being just like you and me. Many people think this. I think many people think this. Well, Mary had a special anointing. There was a little something, I mean, mother of God, come on. She had to have some kind of magical stuff, you know, that, no, she was a human just like you and me who decided to respond to the word of God, which is why she was able to be the mother of Emmanuel, God with us. It says, Mary, in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Mary said, behold, her response, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, here I am. Let it be to me according to your word. That's my prayer that you and I can answer in the same way that when God shows up, we can say, here I am, Lord. Let it be whatever you want. Let it be according to your word, your will, your way. Could we answer that same way or not? We've got to work on that in our lives. Would we be willing to respond the same way that, that, that Mary did and honored the Lord? Check this out. Luke chapter 22. I'm going to jump ahead, okay? I don't know what that means time-wise or in a timeline, but here we are at the beginning, the birth of Jesus. Mary, you're going to have a baby. And she says, whew, I don't know about this, but not my will. Yours be done. 22 chapters later, whatever time that is, Jesus is in the same situation. The son of Mary, son of God, He's in the same position. He's about to go to the cross. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He's wrestling with the reality that he has to now actually go to the cross. And he looks up to the Father and he says, Father, if you can get me out of this, get me out of this. But even if you can't, not my will, but yours be done. He responded the same way that his mother Mary did. It's the response that you and I must have when God shows up and it seems like whether you think he's the author of the mess in your life, messing with you, messing around, or it's something that you've done, whatever it is, are you going to trust in the Lord? Here's what he's calling us to do. He says, have a messy Christmas, but have an M-A-R-Y, Merry Christmas. In other words, respond the way that she did. How do you do that? That little bullet there, write this down. Surrender to God's plans. Surrender to God's plans. Lisa and I went to Bible college in Dallas, Texas, which you're mo most of you are aware of. And I got mugged. I, 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 I don't know if it was the first or second year, but I got mugged. It doesn't really matter when you're mugged. You know, you're like, what's the date today? Uh, uh, you know, and I'm from Iowa, kind of a naive kind of guy. I grew up in Iowa, you know. Not really a whole lot to worry about in Iowa. And um, so I went to Dallas, Texas, and I was getting out of my apartment to get in my car to go to work. And out from behind a dumpster comes this guy, and he has a bandana on from his nose down. And he turns, and, you know, kind of spooked me, and I'm like, oh. And, you know, most people would have thought, run, run, this isn't good. But my radar didn't kick on, and I thought, boy, they sure dress different around here. You know, maybe this is like a, a teen thing, you know. Well, I want to be hip with them, too. So I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm talking to the guy that's mugging me not realizing I'm getting mugged yet. And when it becomes clear is, is when he shows me his gun. And when he shows me the gun and requests my money, you know what I didn't have to think about? I put my hands up. I surrendered. I didn't think about it. I didn't say, I don't know about this. You know, are you really, do you really want to do, do you, what, you need Jesus. Let me lead you. You know, that way, I surrendered. Now, I'm not doubting he probably needed Jesus. But I, that wasn't the time nor the place to try to evangelize. It was a time to surrender. It was a time to surrender. Here's the kicker. I don't think he was very bright because he's robbing a Bible college student. I had $3 in my pocket. So when he said, give me all your money, I thought, oh, Jesus, I'm going to see you soon. I'm dead. I'm broke. I have no money. I said, dude, I have no money. Oh, come on. You've got to have some money. I said, I have, no, I have $3. He's like, that's it. I, I believe with all my heart, he went back to his, his group or his gang and said, dude, we got to take an offering for these Bible college students because they're poorer than we are, man, you know. But I, I said, I got three bucks I, and I offered up everything. I said, you can have my car, you can have, you can have my, my uh, debit card, whatever, shirt off my back, yours, pal. Why? Because I'm going to surrender because I knew there was something greater at stake. God had a bigger, better plan for me than to try to fight this little battle and lose it. I had to have his perspective. How did I get it? Surrendered. There's going to be times when, God, you're going to have a battle that's going on, and you're going to say, I just want to win this argument. I want to win this battle. Do you really? You want to die in that pile? Or do you maybe want to just surrender? But you see, you only surrender when you know the Holy Spirit's calling you to surrender, or you have a gun in your face. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, he, he got $3. Somehow I, I, I got out of that. But you see, it's when I learned to surrender. 
God's going to bring you to a place that if you want to learn what it means to have an M-A-R-Y Christmas, Merry Christmas, you do what Mary did. You surrender. God, not my will, but yours be done. I don't know about this. I don't know what Joseph's going to think. I don't know what my community's going to think. Are they going to buy into this whole immaculate conception thing? Or are they just going to make fun of me? Am I going to be a mockery? I don't know. But not my will. Yours be done. See, Christmas is really about this question, folks. Uh, Is God going to get what he wants from me this year? Is God going to get what he wants from me this year? Christmas is not about what we can get from God. It's not about what we can get from others. Not necessarily about what necessarily we can give to others. It's about surrender. Totally committing to Christ and saying, Lord, here's what I'm going to give you. All of me. All of me. Is there anything wrong with giving gifts, celebrating Christmas? Absolutely not. Knock your socks off. Buy presents. Bless people. Honor them. Love on them. But remember, it's always about what is God going to get from us? this holiday season. Number three, and we'll get ready to close with this. Uh, Write down, we need to understand what it means to have a meaningful Christmas. Because the reality is, is if you don't learn how to have a messy Christmas, if Christmas has always got to be perfect for you, if Christmas always has to look this way and we're not happy until it looks this way, you're going to have a miserable Christmas. Because life's always, it's changing, it's fluid. You've got to learn to be willing to go with that change. Have a messy Christmas, have a merry Christmas, but then that's going to enable us to be able to have a meaningful Christmas. Well, how do you do that? How do you have a meaningful Christmas? Well, it starts by making sure we define meaningful correctly. Because what's meaningful for you might not be meaningful for me. What you call meaningful, you might not call meaningful. And so we can have a lot of different definitions. So if we don't have a right standard, if we don't bring it back to the Word of God, we're all going to be like carpenters who have all different kinds of tape measures, and we're all trying to build the same project together. Sounds like the Tower of Babel to me. It's going to be a mess. People are going to get frustrated and irritated. To have a meaningful Christmas means this, simply. It's to make sure you understand that you have a purpose, and you have significance in this life. God's Word says so. Jeremiah 29, 11. Get, you look it up later. It tells you that He has a plan and a purpose for your life. God says in the, uh, the, the Bible says in the Gospels that God is so detailed and meticulous about the plans he has for you that he even counts the numbers of hairs that you have on your head. What does that have to do with anything? It means simply this. He is so focused and detailed and meticulous that if he had to, he could tell you how many hairs you have or don't have on your head. Because he is so into you. He is so specific. He has a plan. He has a destiny. You have a purpose. And you are significant to the kingdom of God. If you're here today and you said, I'm not significant to the kingdom of God. I'm not even a Christian. I'm not going to tell you that, Pastor, but you don't know this, but I'm not living for the Lord. That's okay. You are still significant to the kingdom of God because we are all sons and daughters of the Most High God. The question is, is are you going to come to see that and get, get your right glasses on so you can see purple, so you can see the promises of God? For you and I to have a meaningful Jesus, what could Jesus mean when he says, have a meaningful Christmas? Well, It means to acknowledge the purpose and the significance that God has in your life and in my life. And and if you start with any other standard, for example, what the world has to say, you're going to be off. But if you start with what the Word of God has to say, you'll always be on solid ground. If you start with the wrong standard, no matter what direction you go, you will be off just a bit. Remember the Leaning Tower of Pisa a couple of months ago? I showed you that picture, and the reason it's leaning is because, number one, they didn't build a deep enough, strong enough foundation, but they were off just a little bit, which caused, over years, things to start to lean. You can have the best plans in the world, but if you make just one wrong direction because you're not hearing the Holy Spirit, it can lead you into a whole different place, can it? True story, in 1975 in Mexico, there were 75 convicts that had a great plan to escape out of prison. They were going to dig a tunnel, and they had it all mapped out in their head. They figured out where they're going to dig and how they're going to get out so they can go under the wall and get out of there and be free. And they had a magnificent plan. The problem is, is when they engaged this plan, April 18, 1976, guided by pure genius and their own wit, They dug through, started to create their turns and navigate, but they were one turn off. And because of that one turn, they ended up digging what they thought was freedom directly into the courtroom where the judges were sitting, holding session. It was the very same courtroom 
that most of the 75 were tried in. The judges were very happy to send them right back to prison. All because they had one direction wrong. They just had one little thing. They thought they knew it. Have you ever been there? I mean, if we were honest with ourselves, I got this. I got this figured out. I know what I'm doing. I know where to go. I know how to get there. And it's usually when we start thinking that way is when we have the best stories of how we got lost. (laughs) Which is why we need to make sure we come to the place of understanding that a meaningful Christmas means leaning into into Jesus. Those those, uh, prisoners, they had a good plan, but they had poor execution. They had poor execution. If you and I get one little thing wrong and we, we get our eyes focused on ourselves or on the world or on our own happiness and take them off of Jesus, then we've got to be very careful because we miss the understanding of what Christmas is all about. It may be messy at times in our life, but God will lead you through the mess because there's a miracle that he wants to birth within you. And then we start to respond like Mary did. We'll understand what it means to have a meaningful Christmas. Luke chapter 1, and in verses 28 and 30, when the angel's talking to Mary, he said to her twice, favored one. It says there, uh, having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. How many of you would love to have the angel of the Lord or the Spirit of God come to you and say, you are highly favored? Anyone? Anyone want that? Okay. Okay, well then hold on to your potatoes here, okay? Because he's here to tell you today, you are highly favored. He didn't put it in the Word of God just so we would read it and say, well, man, Mary's a lucky duck. She got called favor of God, not just once, but twice. Why do you think it's in there? Because he wants you and I to know that as children of the Most High God, you and I are favored by the Most Holy God. We have the favor of God. Let's do that. I have the favor of God. Say it with me. I have the favor of God. Hey, that's pretty good. Let's do it one more time. I have the favor of God. I think you guys believe it, actually, because you do have the favor of God. No matter what you're going through, if all you do is look at what's wrong, you'll become discouraged. But you've got to start looking through what's wrong and start seeing who's in the midst of it because that's the only way we're going to come to the place of understanding what it means to truly have a Merry Christmas. We've got to get God's perspective. And when you have God's perspective you'll see things in a whole new way. There's a shoe manufacturer company that decided to expand their business. So they went into the Congo. But before they wanted to open their business, they decided to send two sales reps into the Congo to kind of vet it out and see what it would be like. They got to the Congo, they looked around, one sales rep wired back and said, prosper nil, no one wears shoes here. The other salesman cabled back and said, market potential, terrific everyone's barefoot. It's all a matter of perspective. When you look at life, do you see what's wrong or do you see what could be right? Do you, do you see, uh, do, do you embrace the, uh, I'm not making fun of anything, but do you embrace the victim mentality and look for ways to just have people take care of you? Or do you say, I'm going to draw near to God. And as, you, as he draws near to me, I'm going to, I stand on my own two feet, and I'm going to say, God, I don't have it all figured out, but I'm going to lean into you. See, God will call us to be okay with the messy Christmas, to have a -A M-A-R-Y Christmas, which leads us to the meaningful Christmas, because what matters the most is simply this. God, what do you have to say? What do you have to say? Then, what matters just as much, if not more, when God speaks is this. How are you and I going to respond to it when God does speak? How are we going to respond to Emmanuel, the God who's with us. Because our response, it's going to make all the difference in the world, church. I want to ask this morning, as we get ready to close, would you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes? And I simply want to ask today this, that Jesus, we invite, more than invite, we acknowledge your presence that's here. Lord, I thank you that no matter what goes on, you're going to lead us through whatever we're dealing with in life. And Lord God, for some people here today, I believe that life is messy. Some of you here today are going through it, whatever it is. It's a mess. You can't get it figured out. It, it, anything from family to finances to marriage to whatever. And you don't have it all figured out. But I want you to know that even what you can't figure out, God completely understands and wants to meet you right where you're at. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you want to hear about a messy Christmas. Boy, I got a story from you. But rather than hear your story, God wants you to hear his. Because he didn't design us to live in the mess. We may go through it. But there's a miracle in the middle of that. 
And so I want to pray today that if you're here and you're going through a difficult time, that God will not only deliver you, but he'll give you fresh new perspective. But I want to ask this first. Are you here today? The greatest gift you could ever give Jesus is your heart. It's to open up your heart and say, Jesus, I want you to come in and be in my life. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to do anything strange, but I'm going to simply ask this. Are you here today and you need to make a decision and ask Jesus into your heart? You want to do that. It's the greatest gift you could give him. Or maybe you're here today you love Jesus, but you've just gotten distant from him. Are you here today? You need to make that right. I'm just simply going to say, ask you to lift your hand so that I can pray with you. I'm not going to call you forward and embarrass you, but it's about saying, I, I need to recommit this. I agree with you. God sees your hand in your heart. Today, there are so many things that you may feel are against you, but when you know that God is for you, all the other stuff doesn't matter. You still got to be responsible. You still got to walk through it, but God says he'll give you the wisdom to be able to, 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 to navigate through those seasons. Lean in to him his arms are open and waiting for you. Is there any other hearts here today? You say, Pastor, that's me. I need to make that decision for Jesus. I'll wait for just a moment. Okay. Then I simply want to do this. I want to pray for us as we get ready to go. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands to this because I believe every one of us to some degree have gone through a difficult season. And I want to pray that as you go through the mess, God will, if I can just say it this way, God help us to see purple <laughs> once again. Help us to see your promises that are ever-present, but somehow we've missed them because we haven't had your perspective. We haven't had your eyes. Father, I lift each and every person here today, and I pray that in the name of Jesus, you will come and cover our hearts. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over our lives. It's the same blood that delivered us. It's the same blood that heals us. It's the same blood that provides for us. And Father, I pray for each and every person here today that Lord, whatever we're going through, whatever difficulties we're facing, we're asking you to give us your perspective in the name of Jesus. Lord, we want the joy to return. We want the joy to remain. So Lord, I'm asking that you would help us to build that character in our life. And as we lean into you, Lord, I ask that you'd reveal unto us, Jesus, your great love for us. Lord, give us your perspective. In Jesus' name, we ask. Amen.